Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of The Real Podcast since uh, we're just going to get straight into it because this is episode 20. We've actually hit 20. That's kind of insane actually. Uh, and as ever, you know, we talk about all things movies, TV, video games, all that sort of crap in no particular order. My name's Reagan and I'm joined once again by my illustrious co-host, the legend that is Dan. Hello Reagan. Hello Dan. Back a week later. One with episode time. 20 hard to hard to believe like when we started this we we just didn't know how long we were going to continue this and we're on episode 20 i kind of figured a week if i'm honest yeah <laughs> I, I figured like you know we, we give it give it a little bit of time and then we're gonna get bored of this but we don't yeah we, we still continue to do this yeah and i think as well considering that the first episode it took so long to edit on my end i think it still took like nearly another week um and i was like i don't really want to do this for a week it's just a little bit it's a little bit much but I've now gone down to a night, so, you know, it's fine. Yes, so, uh, well, you'd think that with episode 20, there'd be, like, a major milestone. We're going to talk about something very personal. We're not. We're just going to talk about Obi-Wan Kenobi, uh, all things spoilers, because that um, piece of content finished uh, earlier this week. So we'll be going into spoilers a little bit later on, um, as ever, talking about the stuff that we've been watching. Um, I think I might have beaten Dan two weeks in a row now though this time by one thing so i'm pretty pleased with myself on that end <laughs> yeah you're gonna have to get you like one of those like little uh, like trophies from poundland with like number one on it but like we're gonna put in like sharpie two weeks i've beaten dan for watches i could i could actually live with that i would be perfectly fine <laughs> with that honestly little poundland trophy yeah um and as ever we've got some news to talk about we've got some uh, retirement news um, we've got Deadpool 3, we've got an X-Wing, uh, we've got Lightyear in the news, which I still haven't seen, and we've got some brand new details on the upcoming Sony critically acclaimed masterpiece that is Craven the Hunter. Um, but we're going to kick things off very, very quickly, and I mean literally, probably not even a minute, because I still haven't seen this one, I just thought it'd be quite funny to mention, um, literally in the last half hour, um, it's been confirmed that Top Gun Maverick hit a billion dollars, somehow. Damn. Um, I haven't seen it yet. I really want to. <laughs> I mean, surely... I mean, I'm just taking a guess here, Reagan. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is this the film of 2022 so far that has reached a billion? I think it's the only one. I think. Oh, okay. Um, wow. I could be wrong. I mean, I don't think Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness hit a billion. Um, and I no, can't think of anything no, else massive this year beyond Morbius making 67.6 more billion dollars. Um, but, you know, I mean, just like trying to convert from more billion to, to pounds, it's pennies, actually, um, <laughs> unfortunately. But yeah, so it's, as far as I know, it's the only film to hit a billion this year, so it already is the highest grossing. Mm -hmm. And it's Tom Cruise's highest grossing film, which I'm surprised that I actually thought it would would have been one of the Mission Impossible films. Um, yeah, I would have thought it would have been a Mission Impossible mm -hmm. film because they... They've, they've got a big audience. Well, I mean, like, I had a quick look, and I think the last one, I think, made, like, 750 760 I think. Um, All right, so well, it wasn't too far away from it, I suppose. But even still, the fact that we're saying that a Top Gun film, a Top Gun sequel, 40 years on, somehow made a billion dollars, yeah. that's just, that's quite Insane. incredible. And all I've heard is, I mean, I've heard nothing but prayers. So, eventually, oh, yeah, I'll get to it's it. It's apparently, like, one of the sort of most well it, it's definitely fresh on rotten tomatoes i know that for a fact yeah i think it's still i, I imagine it's somewhere in the 90s i think it's the high 90s easily. yeah yeah high 90s but i mean i've never seen a top gun film in my life hands up because i it's fine <laughs> yeah the first one's fine i think it's perfectly functional and also just seeing a baby face tom cruise is kind of hilarious um fetus tom cruise fetus tom cruise hey, when, when was the first top gun film 1986 1980, bloody hell. 1986. Okay, that is a long time ago. Very 1980s. <laughs> like, really, really 1980s. Yeah. Um, Damn. But yes, I thought I thought I'd quickly mention that. Um, now, we now have some details on the upcoming Craven the Hunter film, which is the film that everyone wants to see. You know, we saw Venom and we thought, yeah, I want to see a Morbius film. So we got that. And then everyone said, we really want a Craven the Hunter film. Just, ugh. Um, so, um... Aaron Taylor Johnson, who is playing Craven the Hunter, although we should just call him Craven. 
He isn't a hunter in mm. this, um, as I'm now going to discuss. Bear in mind, his name is Craven the Hunter, but okay. Um, so, much like with Morbius and Venom, there's going to be a major change in terms of the characterization of Craven. Um, so, this is quoted from Aaron Taylor Johnson himself. Um, he's described as one of Marvel's most iconic, notorious anti heroes, Spider Man's number one rival. Um, he said he found exciting the fact that, that this character is not an alien or a wizard, he's just a hunter, a human with conviction, an animal lover, and protector of the natural world. He's a very, very cool character. Let's rewind ever so slightly. Yeah. <laughs> um, this mentioned it was Spider Man's like number one villain or something. Number one rival or something. Um, no, he's not. <laughs> I mean, he is certainly a rival. No. But he's not number one. No. Um, Stop it, Sony. I'm taking more Stop. of an issue with the fact that they're calling him an animal lover. And I'm like, he kills animals for sports? That's kind of the point? Oh, God. Okay, so they, they haven't even made the film yet. Uh -huh. And this already just sounds absolutely horrific. Well, I think the way the... They're still filming or the finished filming. There were a couple of set for re released a while ago, but we didn't talk about it because there's nothing interesting there. It's just Aaron Taylor Johnson in a white shirt running around in London. Woo! Yeah. Ooh. Spooky. Content. So, so, so currently, no, he isn't wearing that classic outfit from the comics. He's probably going to get it in like a briefcase at the very end of the film. Just, <laughs> I just, I don't get when's it. When's this supposedly hitting cinema? Um, I think... I think it's either 2023 or 2024. I don't know which one. I would have said next year, just because with them filming. Um, yeah, okay. It just, I don't understand this whole thing that Sony has, where it's like, okay, we'll have the villain-centric film, but we'll just make them an anti-hero and make them a little bit nicer. It kind of works for Venom. I can, yeah. take, I can sort of take it. Morbius, no. He's a vampire. Just no. Um, and Craven the Hunter... You know what it is? If we didn't get Spider-Man No Way Home, we would have had Craven as the villain for, for mm. Spider-Man 3. That's that's what John Watts and Tom Holland wanted to do. So I think we would have gotten like an adaptation of Craven's Last Hunt, which I'd absolutely want to see. Because that thing literally ends with him killing Spider-Man and then him taking the Spider-Man suit for himself and his being his own version of Spider-Man, which is just like awesome. Like I'd love to see yeah. that. Um, I don't love to see this. Grammar. <laughs> I do not want to see this. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's fascinating that they announced this film and not a, a Morbius 2, 2 Morb 2 Eus. 2 Morb 2 Eus. Yeah. I mean, he, I mean, even then, that's... That... Sounds like an episode of Doctor Who, 2 Morb 2 Eus. I wouldn't be shocked. Well, to be honest, I mean, like, I had about as, about as much quality as a more recent episode of Doctor Who. <laughs> Reference! Da, 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 da. Not really. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know about you, I don't care at all. I keep on saying this, like, every single week. There's always a film that gets announced, I'm like, nah, sorry, bye. I'll see it. Well, you don't. Whether I like it or not is going to be a totally different matter. I mean, considering what Morbius was, it doesn't exactly give me a high hope, but, you know, hopefully Sony have seen some sort of sense. Mm -hmm. Which I'm not really relying on too heavily either. No, definitely not. But, yeah, I'll, I'll see it. Yeah. I'll see how it goes. Probably need to like actually look into the character of Craven the Hunter a bit more because I'm not sort of aware of him too much. But I would recommend the '90s animated Spider-Man show. That's all on Disney Plus. Yes. Um, yes, I do have it in my watch list on Disney Plus because I was actually going to start it this week, but then you know, it's so. I mean, life. you know what it is? It's the fact that it's still so good, like even by today's standards. Um, yeah. Even if it's quite funny to think that I, I think Parker's still supposed to be is either in high school or, or uni. Or college, or whatever. Well, I mean, like whatever it is in in America, and he's not exactly built like that. He's 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 pretty big in 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 like the series. It's fascinating. Um, yeah. But then you've got Doc Ock with his classic yellow and green costume. It's utterly beautiful. It's I miss that show so much. <laughs> <laughs> gonna have to end it at some point. They're gonna have to do a final season. Just 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 like treat it like Star Wars: The Clone Wars and bring it back in a couple of years to for a final season to wrap up all all of the cliffhangers it left because it got cancelled. Because actually, well, actually, I think it was Fox at the time. Fox, I mean Fox were just idiots, and they still are. Um, um but we'll move on to uh the the newest Pixar film that's Lightyear, 
That's that's been out for a couple of weeks. I think it's a couple of weeks. Um, I'm still waiting to see it. Um, oh, don't don't you mean Captain America like you? <laughs> because you know <sighs> he does look pretty much identical. It's kind of funny. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we have another deer and another big big blockbuster being banned in countries for daring to have two characters kiss. Um, so God. I'm, I'm going to give you the full list. So, oh, please, please do, because this has piqued my interest. Because when I saw this, I thought, "Huh, which ones okay. have which ones have started kicking up a hissy fit?" Well, um, I, I'm going to guess off the bat, the United Arab Nations or whatever the, that place is called. I can't. I, I'm terrible with this. Arab, Arab something. United Arab Emirates. Yes, that's what yes. I meant. Yes, yes, it is. So I'm assuming that's the first. Uh, second, I'm going to guess. China? South China? China is involved. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I suppose it is now. Um, but yes, the full list is Bahrain, Egypt, mm-hmm. Iraq, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Malaysia, uh, Oman, Oman, I don't know how you say that, sorry, yeah. Palestine, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Syria, and the United Arab Emirates. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. So uh, this is this is due to one of the characters. I don't know the names again. I haven't seen the film, so I can't say too much. Um, There's due to one woman in the film kissing a partner, which is obviously incredibly problematic and woke and blah blah blah. So uh, I'm assuming this is like a same sex issue, hence yeah. why it's been once yeah. again. Um, apparently, China. Uh, was able to get the scene removed initially, but then there was that backlash around the Don't Say Gay bill that was going on uh, earlier this year that Disney was just not helping themselves at all. I think it was Bob Chapek, the CEO of Disney. Um, but but anyway, after all that, they ended up reinstating the scene, so more than likely this has also been banned in China now because they don't like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, we mentioned something like this a few weeks ago. I can't, I can't remember which which thing it was in relation to. Um, was it? I I remember we we spoke about multiverse of madness that was banned in some country for some reason. I've got a vague recollection of that. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Of course, because America Chavez's character's um, gay apparently. Yeah, that was it. That was it. I mean, you... it's because she she signified as an LGBTQ character mm-hmm. or something like that. So there was I can't remember which country it was exactly, but they they just didn't want it. All I'll say is that I'm loving the irony of a film that has characters travelling through the multiverse in spaceships and dealing with a giant genocidal robot that wants to wipe out the human race. Um, But when it comes to a same-sex kiss, that's just too much. Way too much. No, absolutely not. Mm. Absolutely not. Like, how are you? Like, children. Well, 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 I mean, they'll be doing the whole thing of, oh, think of the children. Children didn't care. They really don't. Um... I mean, I've heard some really mixed things on the film anyway. Like, some people really like it. Some really don't. I mean, it's not because of that. It's just because of some story ideas. The only thing I know about this film is that apparently um, the film that the audiences are watching is a film that exists in the Toy Story universe and the Buzz Lightyear toy is based on that film. Right. So okay, it's that's a bit of a so it's a bit of a mouthful, but apparently it opens yeah. with Andy playing with his Buzz Lightyear toy, and then then you get a bit of text on screen, just like referencing the fact that 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 the following film is is Andy's favorite favorite movie or something like that. Mm. I was like, that's a really weird way to try and like force yourself into the Toy Story mythos. Um, yeah, I mean, as you say, that is a bit of a. Bit of a mouthful. Yeah, it's a very unusual one. Um, I'll, I mean, hopefully I'll get to see it at some point. I know, I mean, I know my girlfriend wanted to see it, but we still need to watch Toy Story three and four and cry our eyes out with that. Um, the question is, will I cry more at Lightyear? Probably not, if I'm honest. Yeah. If anything, no, because I, I doubt that. From from what I've certainly, well, I, I haven't seen Lightyear either. I don't intend to because I I'm just not really too big on on stuff like that. I think it's not going to be anything like tragic compared to what Toy Story 3 and 4 because those films are just tragic, man. Oh, yeah. Like, like damn. And to think I've still only seen Toy Story 4 once. 
and I can still remember the mm. bits that just got me. Like, do you know what? I don't even think I've seen Toy Story 4. When it starts off, it doesn't start off as something particularly special. It does feel very run-of-the-mill and so like, oh, okay, we're just doing another Toy Story. But then when you realise what the film is actually telling you... And the- is Toy Story 3 the one with Lutz or the Bear? Yes. Yep, yeah, definitely haven't seen 4 then. Mm-hmm. No, I definitely recommend this. Um, especially because it's three years old as well this, this year. It might even be three years old this month. I think it was either June or July 2019, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, that's that's light year causes all sorts of issues. Not really. Um, next up we have not really film related news. I suppose it is film related. Um, you know we like talking about Star Wars on this podcast. We're going to be talking about Star Wars a little, little bit later on. Um, this is courtesy of you. Um, so thanks, Dan. You know you no problem. You're really pulling one on one for the team because I just I literally messaged you saying. I've ran out of news. I need help. <laughs> and then within like five minutes, I gave you, what, like six, maybe five <laughs> articles or something? <laughs> yeah, well, you... don't worry. Your newsman is here. I was going to say, you'll be delighted to know that two of them are here. <laughs> the other four I didn't use. <laughs> <laughs> the audacity. Well, you know, I already had a few. But yes, so um, there was a prop X-Wing from the original Star Wars films that was bought at, a, at an auction this week. Um Apparently, they were looking at between half a million and a million dollars, and then it sold for 2.375 million. You know, when I saw this, because I I follow a page called the Prop Gallery, who are, Mm. they're a a sort of, I suppose you could say they're like an auction site and a a place that just sort of shows props over the years and things like that. And occasionally they auction them off very expensively because they they are from films that have obviously made a lot of money. They are valued items collector's items yeah. we'll say and when i saw that i thought i have to send this to reagan mm-hmm. i have to and i'm really glad like, you can did you, can you believe that oh i can like now here's the thing wow classic star wars toys always sell for massive amounts mostly because of the way that the way the way that the whole thing went around anyway because george lucas famously um purchased 100 percent of the merchandise and rights because people thought well it's not going to make anything and they mm. just made millions like, like to the point that they ran out of stock. So there was like a range of six figures, I think, for the for the original film, and they ran out of stock. So, so they sent a cardboard diorama to people who had bought these figures. It's basically, say, we promise we're going to get you those figures. You'll have to give us some time. <laughs> yeah. And now they're worth like some, well, two point three seven five million, if not. Yeah. Yours, yeah. I wouldn't care. It's like um. I had the VHS tapes of the original trilogy. I don't know if they were the special editions or the originals, but but my dad gave me them because he's big on Star Wars. And mm-hmm. because I'm a kid at, at the time, not now, I'm still a kid, um, I got rid of them because they were VHSs. Um, yeah. And you've got to wonder how much they go for now. Like, I think even on eBay, they're still extortionate Do you know what is hell. funny? I mean, not just for Star Wars VHSs, like, particular VHSs, like, there are still people out there who get them and collect them, and I'll give you an example here. The original Halloween on VHS is seen as, like, an ultimate collector's item. Really? Yeah. Honestly, like, trying to pick it up, because the only one that I see regularly is a double pack where you get the second Halloween with it, mm-hmm. but on it to get it on its own is, like, a rarity, you know? It's like, wow. Even... Like, Star Wars, the original ones, I mean, I dread to think how much they must go for, because obviously if you get, like, the special editions or something, or it's part of a collector's set, it must be worth a fortune. Yeah, I mean, like, realistically, the best way to own the, like, the original originals is to get the DVD re-releases they did in 2004, which I've actually still got, um, over there somewhere, I think. Um, so you get, like, the 2004 special editions... And yeah, um, scans of the laser disc of the original, so it's you know it, it doesn't look great. Um, so I, I mean that's why I, I always say my favorite version of Return of the Jedi is actually the DVD re-release because it looks the most consistent. You've got the updated music at the end. You still got the stupid Cantina band thing, but you don't have Darth Vader going no, which is just bollocks. <laughs> um, so. 
which, you know, that's probably a hot take, but I actually prefer a special edition re-release of one of the original films. I don't care, they're all movies at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, I mean, 2.375 million. <laughs> yeah. That's thing, you can't even play with us. You, you li- you're literally just going to have it on a... St- on a plinth and just put it in a bloody do you know what i i would be really like curious to see how that auction went down like i wonder like if they they obviously must start the bidding at something like an agreed price or something like that i mean what did you say it was going to go for like a half a million or something like that between five hundred thousand dollars and a million dollars okay so like, let's say they started off at like two hundred fifty thousand. like it must have climbed so high oh yeah like it must have literally been somebody like every second pointing up those little like weird card things you do at an auction where it's like oh i have like 1.5 million over here i have 1.6 over here it's like what <laughs> no honestly like i'm already terrified of, of like doing auctions on ebay I'd, I'd hate to try and do something like this because i would go completely overboard and then end up buying it for 2.375 million dollars and realize oh crap i'm gonna yeah. have to get rid of all of my organs and, <laughs> and even then i'm going to have for... to sell every bit of my body <laughs> in order to pay for this item and there, and then I can't have it because I haven't got any organs because I'm dead. Well, honestly, Star Wars like merchandise, like ugh, just sudden, suddenly you wish the film bombed. Honestly, <laughs> uh, Next up, we have Deadpool three, and um, this is the first bit of actual like details we've got on Deadpool three, because um, I think a lot of people were really curious as to what was going to happen with that, because. It doesn't really. I remember f- rumors floating around, and I mean, pretty much from what this piece of news said, I think most of that's been debunked, really. Yeah, it is interesting though that I think Kevin Feige did confirm that it was still going to be rated R, which I kind of figured it was going to be. Um, yeah. And well, but, but actually, this is also quite interesting. I was, I'm going to briefly mention this just in regards to a rating. Um, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. If you have a look at it on Disney Plus, it actually has the highest age rating of any MCU film. It's now classed as a 14 plus. Mm. So essentially, a fifteen. Yeah, um, which I find is quite funny. It's probably because of that bit when um, when Anson Mount decide, decides to blow up the inside of his head because he because he can't stop talking. Crazy person. Or when <laughs> Patrick Stewart loses his ability of his neck. <sighs> didn't be didn't be referencing that again. I fucking hate that. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that film even more now. <laughs> Another week, another dislike of Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Oh, God. Um, but yes, yeah, so, Rhett Reese, who, uh, I think he did the script for both previous ones, both previous dead, dead, I should say. Um, so he said a little bit about what the story's going to be, but I mean, it's, it's still quite big. Um, he, mm-hmm. he said, it's a wonderful opportunity for fish out of water. Deadpool is a lunatic at the centre of a movie. To drop a lunatic into a very sane world, it's straight butter. It's going to be really fun. Um, despite the fact I really don't like Deadpool 2, and I think the first film is kind of dated at this point, I'm actually legitimately looking forward to this one. I think this could be a lot of fun. Yeah. I'm picturing a montage of like the biggest MCU moments and there's just Deadpool reacting to them in just an just in his own Deadpool, which granted, if that was just the film, I'd be fine with that. Yeah, <laughs> I'd be totally fine with that. Um, I mean, is there anything that you want to specifically see in the Deadpool three in the MCU? I don't. Do you know what? I haven't. It's been ages since I've watched Deadpool. I mean, I I remember parts of two, but it's it's one of those films where like I think you watch it and then you kind of forget about it for a while. Yeah. But I mean, we'll we'll see what it brings. I mean, I'm go- I'm looking forward to because I I like Deadpool. I I the the second one was it was good in my mind, but it wasn't anything to what the first one was. Dan, I'm sorry, but you are just wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're wrong. <laughs> Re- denied immediately. Why don't you go and blow yourself up like Ryan Reynolds did in the film, and then just regenerate? Because I need you to ho- to co-host this po- this podcast with me. <laughs> I wouldn't mind that actually. That could be quite fun. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, this is something I, you know, as I say, I am looking forward to. I'm, I'm still being quite careful because I have mentioned in the past how my interest in Ryan Reynolds' sense of humor is kind of waning. Like I liked him when yeah. he was kind of restrained in the Adam Project, but I didn't like him in uh, Free Guy. Um, 
which I think more people... I still haven't bit... watched that. I don't even intend to. No, there's been a few people who've been watching it. I've noticed on Letterboxd and I'm not too big on it either. Um, just just one of those things. I just... I didn't like it, quite yeah. frankly. Um, and our final bit of news. Um, this one's quite sad. But I think I kind of figured I'd see this news at some point. Um, John Williams. The John Williams. Yep. Um... He's confirmed that his, his work on the upcoming Indiana Jones 5 will be his final film composition. Um, he's not entirely retiring. He's just moving away from big movies, maybe just films in general, and just doing more indie, smaller stuff after the fact. Um, I do have a quote from him. Um, part of this, I don't know if is actually genuine because it's kind of a bit of breaking news. I don't know if you've heard this quote from him. Um, but he says, at the moment I'm working on Indiana Jones 5, which Harrison Ford, who's quite a bit younger than I am, I think has announced will be his last film. So, Harrison Ford has never mentioned that at all. Mm. Um, I mean, look, if it is, it's a pretty, pretty spot on one to end with, I mean, considering his love for the character. Um... Yeah, I was going to say that exactly. I mean, at least, you know, if he chose to hang the fedora up, we'll say, mm. you know, the Indiana Jones. If he chose to hang the fedora and the whip up, I think it would be a good way to do it. Yeah, definitely. You know, rather than, I mean, don't get me wrong, like if he chooses to make some other film and then calls it a last one, yeah, that's fine. But I think it would just be a little bit sort of special and, and to the legacy of Indiana Jones, you know, because I mean, we grew up with Indiana Jones. Oh, yeah. Really. So I think it would be a little bit special, you know. But mm. I, again, this is this guy's choice. But he is a he's a pretty old actor. You know, I mean, hell, Indiana Jones Five could be like you know the best in the series for all we know. <laughs> but you know, we, we won't, we won't <laughs> breath too much on that. Oh, that we'll I mean, I mean, that, that, that is a hot take on a film that hasn't even finished filming yet. <laughs> God damn yeah. it! Um, yeah, I mean, I think as well is that I I actually assumed that he, that John Williams would have retired. After episode nine, I figured he would have yeah, done that I mean, then. I, I mean, he has a a career under his belt. He has like a few careers, you know. Like he's, I mean, like, like he's been doing it for long. My enough. goodness. Um, I mean, I think he's ninety one now. I'm thinking, Jesus yeah. Christ, you're ninety one. So I can, I can definitely music. see why he's not necessarily wanting to retire fully, but taking a break from big films because, I mean. He's obviously got to orchestrate all the, the composure and all this stuff. You know, it's going to be a lot of hard work for a guy who's 91. Mm. You know, he's not he's not the age he was when he did Star Wars back in, you know, 77. Yeah, and even yeah. then, like, I'd be hard-pressed to say that his music for the sequels was particularly great. I mean, I, I mean, I think of the three, I would have said The Last Jedi was probably the best score that he did because Force Awakens felt very easy felt very safe mm. which in fairness i think that was because at the time he was quite ill i think i think when he was doing it so that's fair enough but then rise of skywalker sounded very safe much like the film itself I've got to stop saying that i keep on referencing my hatred for that film. i know we, we keep we keep referencing well you keep referencing this absolute film that's it scruffy <laughs> nerf herder scruffy of a film nerf herder. <laughs> um yeah i just I didn't like his score for that one either. Um, it's really just episode eight. Um, I know he. I know he. Had, I, I think he uh, developed the score for, or at least the main theme for Obi Wan Kenobi, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Well, obviously, I'm sure we will. We will be. Well, we're That's going just... to be talking about, but we are, a bit yes. later on. Um, yeah, I. I, just, I don't know. What, I, I don't know what I think on this, just because we haven't heard the score yet for Indiana Jones Five. Which even then, yeah. I actually really like the score for Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. I think I think it's actually really solid. Um, I like all the scores for the, the Indiana Jones oh, films. Yeah. I mean, even if Kingdom of the Crystal Turd is not exactly <laughs> the greatest film ever. Well, I even listened to the score for Temple of Doom a couple of days ago. It's it's great. I think it's really great. I think that the, the scores for, well, particularly that trilogy is just fantastic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, even like you know the the first Indiana Jones on Raiders of the Lost Ark, the score is brilliant. Mm -hmm. Temple of Doom is absolutely superb, and the Last Crusade is just fantastic. It, it goes one. perfectly with the film. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know? And I mean that is that is my favorite Indiana Jones entry by far. It used to be Raiders of the Lost Ark, but I think just revisiting it years later, it, it's just always going to be the Last Crusade from now on. Like, yeah, definitely, without a doubt. I am I'm pretty certain we'll cover the Indiana Jones films at some points. That'd be quite fun. 
Um, but that is it for the news. We've actually, you know, we've done pretty well. Um, now it's time to hear what absolute smut. You forgot to do the jingle. I can't remember the jingle. Okay, 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 you know what? Do, do, do. The shit the dad's watching. <laughs> Okay, so note to myself while I'm editing, I'm just going to keep this bit in the actual thing as well. Uh, just try and remember to put it in, like, now, if you can get a hold of the audio. If you can't, then just, I don't know, put in some royalty-free music or something. Just something like that. Good job, Reagan, in the future. <laughs> I'm probably going to forget. Um, yes, let's hear the smuts that... Oh, sorry. The shit that Dan's been watching this week. la 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 <laughs> All right, Probably so... Halloween again. <laughs> no, surprisingly not. Oh. <laughs> so 15 watches this week, Reagan. Mm. Monday, we started with Doctor Who, Planet of the Giants from 1964. Uh, this is a William Hartnell episode. It's a three-parter. Oh, phew. Thank God. The The tragic thing is, though, the one of the longest Doctor Who episodes is up next. Is it Dalek Invasion of Earth? It is Dalek Invasion of Earth. Well, I might just watch that one instead because I kind of gave up on Do you on know what it ones. is? I was actually going to and then I thought, you know, I, I just can't. No. I can't. <laughs> Not now. So instead I watched Alligator 2, The Mutation of 1999. <laughs> I... um, okay, well, what to say about this? You know, when you watch a film and you just don't know what this film is trying to be. Yes, a lot. It tries to balance this whole thing of crooked politicians and, you know, real estate agents being crooked and mayors being crooked. And mm -hmm. the film forgets that it is actually about a killer alligator. It's like, oh, yeah, we've got a killer alligator. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Enough to say about that, really. No. The alligator's cool, just the film isn't. That's all there is to say about that <laughs> film. Now, here's the first bit of surprising stuff. A revisit to Grand Theft Auto 4 from 2008. That game is 14 years old. Oof. Damn. I mean, it's... Mm. 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 I mean, I like it to a point. I mean, I never finished it. Never finished it at all. Blasphemy. <laughs> Absolute blasphemy. <laughs> oh, well, I'm sorry. Shocking. Yeah, I've... <laughs> Trying to know the sad thing. I installed this game on Monday. Uh. I finished it on yesterday. You really need a life. <laughs> <laughs> My Th God. This is just solely like GTA 4. This isn't like the the stories from Liberty City or whatever the hell it's called. Battle of the yeah. or something. Yeah, Battle of the Gates only in Lost in the Damned, which I'll, I'll get into a bit later on. Oh, The Island, 1980, starring one Michael Caine. See, when you said The um, Island, I thought you meant it was the Michael Bay one, which is also called The Island. No. Okay. <laughs> no. It's from 1980. Basically, this is just another film that just does not know what the hell it wants to be. Mm. From what I looked at it, it was Michael Bay and his son get captured by a bunch of cannibalistic cultists, but instead they're just really bad pirates. Okay. Yeah. So it's it tries to be like a pirate horror film. It has got to be one of the worst things I've ever watched, dude, in my life. The pacing is all over the place. The pirates are just laughable. The whole plot is just laughable. Mm -hmm. It's ugh, not good. Wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> and now for a short film that was on Channel 4's Random Acts. Uh, this is called Zominic or Zominic the Cannibal Baby from 2017. Great. Have you ever seen those, like, little baby adverts was like you know my my child needs a good diet it just rips the absolute piss out of those adverts by this there's this mother who's like obviously doing a self-commentary and she's saying no my my baby needs a good strong diet and she opens the fridge and there's all these like body parts just scattered in the fridge it's like a human head and stuff oh, in jesus there. christ I wasn't it's expecting absolutely that. nuts <laughs> and then there's like a there's like a bit where they go in the garage and like their father is like sawing off a leg Jesus. And it's like, oh, how, how, how's the cutting going, honey? It's like, oh my god, I did not expect this at all. <laughs> yeah, it, it was brilliant. Tuesday was an episode of Family Guy from season 16, I believe, called Three Directors, and Peter basically gets fired 
from his job at the brewery by Tarantino, Wes Anderson, and Michael Bay. The Michael Bay segment was absolutely hilarious because he it just rips the absolute yeah. piss out of Michael Bay. I can. I... Uh, there, there is a, a part where it involves a transformer, and yeah, <laughs> Peter Peter says like, "Let's let's make this so let's have so many close ups. It's hard to tell what the hell is actually going on." <laughs> and there's just all these like close ups of of crap just going on in the film, and I thought that is just so naughty. You've done that. <laughs> But it was funny, the, the Tarantino one was very much like Kill Bill and the Wes Anderson one was just like a Wes Anderson film. It was mad. Yeah. A good little tribute to it, but also just sort of taking the mick in a, in a good way, though. Mm-hmm. Now, are you aware that Spider-Man, Spider-Man 2 and Spider-Man Homecoming came to Disney Plus? Of course I am. I know Well, everything. I decided to watch Spider-Man <laughs> 2002. Mm. Damn. Uh Look, it's still a great film, but holy smoke. Is it very 2002? <laughs> yeah, it's very 2002. We are who we choose to be. Now choose! Ah, the inch, <laughs> <winchy> spider. <laughs> oh, you know, I, I was in fits at that bit. Down came the goblin. And washed, and washed the spider, the spider out. out. <laughs> I still chuckle at that so much. So Wednesday, the third episode of Miss Marvel... My opinion on it hasn't really changed. It's good. Definitely not favourable compared to the other ones, but still enjoying it. Spider-Man 2 from 2004, because, you know, I I watched the original. I'm obviously going to go watch the sequel, of course. I still maintain that the second one is still a little bit better, in my opinion. Oh, yeah, definitely. That's the same for a lot of people, for sure. I I just much prefer it. I think it's so much better. Obi-Wan Kenobi Episode 6... Um, me and Reagan are obviously going to be talking about this later, but... Yeah, we're yeah gonna... it was good. Yeah, yeah. It was good. Yeah, yeah. Now, here's something I was... Well, me and my girlfriend decided to watch this. It's called Keep Sweet, Pray, and Obey. It is a documentary on Netflix about the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints cult. That was a mouthful. Ooh, um, This is ooh. really that... Oh, so we both... Okay, so I'm not going to give too much away yet, but that means we've both watched something this week that's gotten something to do with the church and Jesus. That is really interesting. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. It's a, f- it's a limited series of four parts, and it is very, very dark. <laughs> but yeah, it is basically an insight into the poly, what do you mean, poly cult where you, you, in a religion where you don't just stick to having one sexual partner. You have like, multiple wives and things like this poly poly some I, polyamorous I, I or something even, yeah i don't know something, something. like that poly poly gay gives skim something polyamorous <laughs> poly, gam- gamorous <laughs> dan can't pronounce shit. <laughs> uh, and it, it looks into the underage marriages and the other horrific deeds of the well the i, I don't know what you would call it like the the president of this cult will say it's pretty dark. Right. It gets really dark and it, it, it kind of triggers you. And I think that's what Netflix does so well with true crime. Mm. Yeah, they kind of lose steam with every one they do. But this one was pretty thought provoking. It made me angry about this guy. <laughs> so it was a good insight to it. And that's what I think is good about true crime. Like it, a good documentary to me is something that can provoke you. Yeah. And it makes you like feel for the victims. Whereas like you watch something quite generic. It's like, well, why should I care? Mm. Like, so yeah, it was it was a pretty good insight. Uh, Thursday, I didn't watch anything because I was just far too flustered with the heat. It was ridiculous on Thursday. Yeah, it was an absolute heat wave. It has been a pretty hot week, hasn't it? <laughs> now, Friday. Right. Okay. Right. So, I'm a PC gamer. <sighs> I used to be a console gamer, but I kind of refused to pay for a membership in order to play for games. I don't really do that anymore i don't really fancy paying like a tenner a month when i play like maybe three or four games or something like that mm. so steam has a summer sale on basically any game you can think of is on sale at the moment so i got 14 games i got alien isolation the deluxe version of it good uh avp classic so this is like the original avp game from 2000 mm. 
Alien vs. Predator from 2010, which I've played non-stop. I love that game so much. Damn. I've obviously started with the Predator campaign because, you know, that is, like, so much fun. There's nothing mm. more satisfying than just going into stealth mode and creeping up on a human and doing something utterly horrific to them. <laughs> Such as ripping out their spinal column, but, you know. Oh. Now, as part of the Alien deal... Aliens Colonial Marines was included in that for the, like... Well, to pay for it normally was about 25 quid, and I just did not want to do that. Yeah. Because it doesn't deserve £25 worth. It should be about 99 pence. There we go, then. Quite I... frankly. But yeah, I got that basically in for free. Because I bought the deluxe version of it. Uh, Dying Light Definitive Edition. Uh, I love Dying Light. I don't... Well, you're not really into zombies and stuff like that, so I can't really talk too much about it. But yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, Half-Life 2, a game I played absolutely years ago and it's still one of my favourite games of all time. Mm. I played one of them, I think, but I couldn't say which one. I think I think it's because I borrowed... Um, isn't there like a compilation called The Orange Box or something? Yeah, it's called The Orange Box. So you get Half-Life 2, Portal and Team Fortress 2 in it. Oh, okay. So it was... I was actually going to buy The Orange Box, but I just wanted Half-Life. Right. So I just ended up buying Half-Life, and I, I played a bit of it. It's just fun to go down memory lane with Half-Life, because it's still such a fun game. Yeah. Uh, I bought some horrific games. I don't know why I did this. Outlast 1 and 2, as well as Evil Within 1 and 2. I'm going to be scared. Yeah, I played I played a decent amount of, of the first Outlast. It's actually quite creepy, and I tried to do a bit of Evil Within, but it's not nearly as scary as I thought it was going to be, if I'm honest. Yeah, Evil Within... I've I've done that game a few times and it is, it's just screwed up. If I'm being honest, <laughs> yeah, it, is. it is very mind boggling. Now there was Dead Island Definitive Edition, so again oh. this was like Dead Island, Dead Island Riptide for like a fiver, you know, yeah. down from like twenty odd quid. So I thought, oh, may as well grab a bargain while I'm here. And Saturday, there's Watchers. Oh, now I'm gonna butcher pronunciation of this up. Hagazusa from 2017. It is about, well, think of The Witch. It's basically just another version of The Witch, but it's a German version of it. Equally as screwed up and as messed up. It's really screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the same level as The Lighthouse and The Witch, I'd say. It's really, really messed up. The Green Inferno. This is a film by Eli Roth. I have a lot to say about this. Oh, Jesus. Okay. I'm I'm okay, ready. so I've put this film off for years. I've wanted to watch this for years, but I've never really got around to watching it. The horror side of it is fine, mm. right? But this film, it, it focuses on environmentalism and basically a bunch of environmentalist teenagers go to the Amazon, you know, protest, and they get arrested and sent back home, but their plane crashes and are captured by a cannibal cult the horror in that is fine but eli roth just has a tendency to put in humor in things that just don't need humor right so one scene i'm going to describe to you i don't know why the hell this was in but you know they they witness one of the characters get absolutely butchered by these cannibals now you know characters seeing that are going to obviously have some sort of trauma surely mm -hmm. you know they're going to be distressed no, one of the characters gets a stomach rumble and has diarrhea in the corner of the cage. Like, uh -huh. it, it was deliberately meant to be funny. I just thought, really like, funny. what on earth was the point? <laughs> yeah. Like, because of that, it just went so goofy. And it ruined it. It could have literally been a four out of five, in my opinion, because of the horror. Because it is a pretty horrific film. Hmm. But... Because of this stupid humour that is injected into it. And there, there are other examples as well. You know, there are just stupid instances of one-liners. And ugh. There, there, there's more bads than goods, to be honest. It probably doesn't deserve the rating I gave it. I gave it three out of five because of the horror in it. Hmm. But as I say, the humour just really makes the film quite goofy. You know, there's a reason for why it is pretty low in terms of critic responses to it. Because, honestly, that humour to it is just yeah unnecessary. Mm. If none of that was in there, it would have been great. Oh, yeah. 
and it tries to be Cannibal Holocaust, which I haven't seen. I was seen. just about to say it did sound like a discount version of Cannibal Holocaust. It basically is. like it. The, the horror is there, but it is nowhere near the absolute barbaricness of Cannibal Holocaust. Mm. Nowhere near. No. And the others from 2001? Yeah, I've got a vague recollection of that one. That's Nicole Kidman, isn't it? Yeah, it's got Nicole Kidman in it. This is on Netflix if you're interested in watching it. I mean... Definitely one of the better sort of haunted house films mm. out there. I mean, it, it's got a few issues with piercing, I found, but still pretty enjoyable. It had me hooked. Mm. Won't lie there. But yeah, that's pretty much all I've all I've watched. Most of it has just been revisiting games from ages ago, like GTA Four, yeah, and then completing it like a week later and wondering why I have no life. It isn't really a wonder, at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I didn't even intend to. Like, I, I, I was just so invested in not playing it for absolutely years on end. Mm. But you know what's so funny is, like, I still prefer it over five. I would quite like to do a video, well, to, to do an episode dedicated to that game. That that would be quite interesting because that's gone through such a shift, especially for me in the last couple yeah. of years. Um, that would be quite interesting. So even just to compare it to the previous... That'd be, yeah. That, I, mean, I mean, that'd be an interesting one. Definitely something I can work with there. But all I'll say is, like, it, it's been a fun revisit, and I'm just working my way through the Lost and the Damned at the minute, as well as the Balagate Tony, which are the, well, originally they were like the DLC of it, but then it was released as part of the actual game, and I think it's called yeah. Episodes from Liberty Cities, Something not like to that, be yeah. confused with Stories from Liberty City, which was a game on the PSP and PS2. Mm-hmm. It's been fun, and I mean, I have a lot of games to play, and I'm going to be starting Alien Isolation. I'm dreading it because that game petrified me. I, I never think, completed it. I'm going I to think, have to now. I think as soon as you, well, I'm on my fourth or fifth playthrough. Um, <laughs> yep. And this is my third on Nightmare Mode, and I'm st- so far I still haven't killed any humans. I'm feeling pretty accomplished with that because I really want to finally Damn. get that bloody achievement because I'm never going to get the one where it says complete the game without dying, mate. Like. <laughs> Yeah, that that like, is in, that is like, impossible. Yeah, and especially the point that I'm the at. The BS which I'll get that to, Alien gives like, you is ah, absolute. It isn't even the Alien. Mm-hmm. It's not even the Alien. It's not the Alien. No, it's, it's just your own stupidity. A little bit. A little bit yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, but that's that is everything that I've done this week. Mm-hmm. I, I will mention that I I signed up to Audible as I previously mentioned before, and I listened to the narration of Aliens. It's pretty much just the director's cut. More or less. Oh, okay. So there's the origin of Newt and her family, as well as the colony on LV-426, as well as some other stuff that didn't make the cut as well. It's pretty mm. interesting listening to it, must say. Yeah. And William Gibson's version of Alien 3. It's only two hours long, but it is sort of directed like a film. As obviously, there's no visual side to it. Lance Hendrickson is a narrator in it. He actually voices Bishop. Mm. And yeah. Michael Bean as well, as Hicks. So I thought that was pretty interesting, and it was fun to listen to, despite it only being two hours. It was pretty solid. Pretty sure, yeah. Very different, very different from its original idea. Yeah. Very, very different. Oh, yeah, very, very, very different. Yes, very, very, <laughs> very different. So, passing the torch, or skull, or whatever item you desire to you. Let's pick an item. Um, I'm going to go with the Lego TARDIS that is currently on the desk that I'm now putting up to the webcam, even though you can't see because this is audio. <laughs> ha! It's okay, I, I, can, I can vouch for you saying, yes, it is a Lego TARDIS audience. Yes, it, it is the official Lego TARDIS. Um, yeah, I will actually reference Alien Isolation first then, because um, I, I, I did go back to playing that a bit this week. Um, it's still the thing... It's, <laughs> it's fascinating how for a game that's called Alien... The most infuriating mm-hmm. thing and the most terrifying thing is the androids. They still are. And Those I've been, working, Joes. Uh, I've been no. stuck on one bit for about two weeks. That despite, uh, again, I'm on my fourth or fifth playthrough. I could not remember what the hell you do to finish it. Um, for those that have played it, it's, it's at the point, I think it's, it's literally the mission that occurs after you... Actually, that's a good point. How much of Alien Isolation did you actually get through before I start spoiling it? I definitely... I 
I couldn't definitively say where I got up to, but I definitely got past the part where you meet the medical officer and you have to get him like supplies or something, but he turns out to be a backstabber. Okay, so you're still pretty uh, uh, alien. Okay, so I, w- I won't say too much, but, yeah. but there's a point when the alien vanishes and you're just dealing with the androids. Um, and it's absolute nightmare fuel. I swear to God. Um, nightmare fuel. Like, especially when... Because I'm still the sort of person that is... I, I kind of flicker between trying to get through a level as quickly as possible or really taking my time. Um, yeah. And in the case of this mission, I really just flick it back and forth. Like, fuck it, I'm just going to run. Doesn't work because the capture... <laughs> I'm going to run and see what happens. Well, that's thing because on Nightmare Moors, if they catch you, you have no time to get out of like the headlock. They just oh, kill so you You can't like break free or nah. anything like that. You're just dead. Oh. Nah. But grief. I do love the fact... Well, I don't love... I hate the fact that it still gives you the option to try and fight back. I'm like... There's no point. It doesn't do anything. <laughs> like, God damn it's it. It's just there to taunt you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I did... I think I have eventually gotten past that bit, I think. Um, I think mm-hmm. I think it was yesterday when, when I got a sword. Um, and it just... It, it's so... So annoying. Um, oh, God. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. I did, but I'm still dealing with the androids. But I, I deliberately didn't bother to save at one point because I thought, well, I know what I'm doing next. And I lost about yeah. 15, 20 minutes worth of progress. I was like, oh, well, no. Fuck you. On nightmare mode <laughs> yeah. as well. Fuck oh, you, no, cre- Reagan. Bloody creative assembly in your attempt at making a bloody alien game. I say attempt. It's the best alien game ever made. Um, but yeah, I've, yeah I'm not going to touch that for at least another week now. Do you know what? I, I think I got a little bit further on. I distinctly remember this part where you... You go down in this cargo bay or something like that, and you have to get like a working jaw to assist you. Yes. Now I didn't believe this for one second because, in my opinion, the working jaws were just pure evil. Yeah. Because they are. But this one is is fine and dandy for a time being. Tut tut. Tut tut. No. <laughs> Stop it. Are you having a you nice know, day? I've never ever been. I've played some pretty horrific games. I've played the likes of Outlast and completed them multiple times. And there is nothing more scary than a pale-faced android just walking towards you. Oh, yeah. Like, it's... That just says, tut, tut. Yeah. I just, like... No. No. I've seen it's it. It's utter nightmare fuel. Yeah. Um, so, first... First one, well, it's a rewatch. I wasn't wasn't even expecting to. Um, Ant-Man. Ant-Man. Oh, that's interesting. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, I wasn't planning on it. I mean, I was planning on watching something stupid. And it just... So what, what drew you to Ant-Man? Because that is the last thing I expected I've got from a you. vague recollection of accidentally looking at fan stick And I think even my girlfriend was saying, I want to watch something stupid and something I can turn my brain off. I'm like, well, good luck with that one. There's a few, there's a few of those on, 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 on <laughs> Disney+. Plus. Um, I remember watching the trailer for... Well, before before I get to Ant-Man, uh, her, her comments on the thing from fan stick were quite funny. She was like, is he completely naked there? I'm like, yes, he is. He is a completely naked giant talking rock. It's like, ah, why hasn't he got clothes? I'm like, because he's a giant talking rock. <laughs> like, like honestly. Um, and then I think I was initially going to do that, but I thought ah, that's that's just boring. Like it's really yeah. boring. Um, I refuse to watch Fan Fantastic Four: Rise of the Silver Surfer again because it's. Oh. You know what? Like I I haven't touched one of those films at all because of. I just look at it and I think I just can't. I've only seen Not the second yet. one. I didn't see the original. I've never seen it at all. Um, mm. I don't intend to if it's similar to uh, this one, which is ironic because it's directed by a guy called called Tim Story. And it's a film that has no story. The irony. <laughs> all, all it has is Tim. Um, Tim. And then suddenly I just, I saw Ant, Ant-Man for a second. I thought, I haven't watched that for a couple of years. I've, I quite like to give that a rewatch. Um, mm-hmm. Like, literally, I haven't watched it for a good few years. Um, yeah. Good fun. Pretty disposable. Much like its sequel. Difference being is that the sequel isn't fun. It's actually pretty pap. Um, uh, I'm pretty certain I only pirated that, if I'm completely honest. Sorry. I just It's just a thing. I wasn't going to go and watch it in the cinemas. Um, and I thought it was rubbish. Um this one you can tell it was going to be directed by Edgar Wright. There's a lot of it there that feels very Edgar Wright that the sequel doesn't yeah. have. Um, I still love the way that uh, the 
Luis uh, does like the exposition of how he how how he learns about the heist and how he learns about all this stuff. It's yeah. beautiful. Um, I can remember someone saying they really wanted a, they really wanted an MCU recap, but done in that style with. Uh, Michael P. Yeah, I remember seeing that, and you know what it is? I I welcome that so much. Yeah, because when he does the recaps, they're so fun. Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure it's like when when he's interrogated by by the cops, he just does it again. Like he just narrates it. It's so fun. Oh, it's beautiful. Honestly, I think it's really great. Um, the film is you know as I said, the film itself isn't anything particularly flash. I think Paul Rudd's energy saves a lot of the more mediocre moments. Um, and no offense, um. Aaron Cross is no one's favourite. Or, or, or was it Darren Cross? I don't even know if it's Aaron Cross or Darren Cross. Oh no, Aaron Cross is from the bloody Jason Bourne spin off with Jeremy Renner, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Darren Cross is the villain in Ant Man. I'm like, woo, he's so terrifying and so deadly. Like, oh my goodness, Yellow Jacket. <laughs> that being said, I still think the funniest scene in that film is when the two of them are fighting on the Thomas the Tank Engine train track. And Thomas the Tank Engine gets massive, and it's hilarious. <laughs> Do you know what? At first, that terrified me because that that oh, is yeah. the face of a like that that face is so terrifying. <laughs> the eyes just going back and forth. It's like no, stop. Yeah, it definitely hit differently considering how much of a fan of Thomas the Tank Engine I was as a kid. Like, I watched Thomas and the Magic Railroad so many times as a kid. Yeah, I was the same. And do you know what it is? When you look back on it years later, you realise just how terrifying things like that are. Diesel 10. My goodness. <laughs> no. Like, the faces on some of them are just absolute nightmare fuel. But Peter Fonda's in that one. <laughs> it's, it's nuts. It's like the little, um, the little, like, coal truck things. They have the most, like, sinister-looking faces I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. They're just so angry. Yeah. Um... Yeah, as I say, I think it's pretty fun. It's by no means my favourite MCU film. It's probably somewhere in the middle. Um, now, I haven't mentioned this one at all to you. Um, mm. Paramount Plus is now out in the UK. Um, yep. I pre-installed it, so I got it day early somehow. So I only really wanted to watch it for one thing. Um, Halo. The ah, first three yes. episodes of Halo's on there. Now, this is the uh-huh. much-talked-about, highly controversial adaptation of the Halo franchise, which we have spoken about in the past. We're both big fans of it. We will definitely be, be discussing those games in the future. Um, definitely. This has been in development hell for years. And I mean, like, years. I mean, I can still remember yes. back in the day when Peter Jackson was announced to be developing a Halo film. Like, he was on stage and everything yeah. talking about it, and it just never happened. Um, now we have this new one that's executive produced by Steven Spielberg, which is basically a name only because he's not going to be particularly involved in this at all. Um, yeah. And this also makes the highly controversial decision to, um, work in its own timeline, dubbed the silver timeline that omits a lot of the canon of the games. Now, I'm going to say this up front. I actually have no issue with this. I've said I've, I've said this in the past when it comes to adaptation. I don't mind if you change things up so long as what you do change and what you replace it with is interesting and also yeah. good. So, <sighs> negatives first. <laughs> I'd usually go with positives, but I've got more to say on the negative side of things. Um, He's cutting deep like a Covenant plasma weapon. <sighs> The incredibly CGI weapons. Like, there's literally a shot where Master Chief drops his assault rifle, which looks very faithful to the game, but it cuts to a purely digital shot of the gun dropping to the ground. And I'm like, you have the prop. Just drop the prop. Mm. Hashtag drop the prop. Um, and I didn't like that. Um, the music as well, I don't think it's very good. It's fascinating, actually, that apparently they weren't able to use the music from the games. And then the whole thing was eventually sorted out just before the series finished. Oh, damn. That's kind of funny. So you do hear a little bit of it there. It's a little bit of it in the opening titles, which are relatively interesting. You, you would have thought, though, like a series that is adapted from Halo, you'd have like full access to its soundtrack library. Yeah. But clearly not this time. Um, Now... 
I'm vaguely aware of what they do later on in the series, but I can't say too much because there's only three episodes out on Disney. On, sorry, on Paramount Plus. Um, they're doing it week by week, mm. which they did exactly the same thing with The Mandalorian because when that dropped in on Disney Plus in the UK, it had already finished in America, so you had to see it away even longer. It's annoying. Um, this makes the really controversial decision to literally before the first episode finishes to have. Master Chief reveal his helmet. Oh, no. Now, the reason that no. I'm not as bothered, I think, initially, is because that character doesn't work as the lead of a TV show. Because in a game, you're controlling him. He's meant to be, yeah, like, a you know, a placement for the audience, for the gamer. You can't have that for a TV show. So I can sort of understand the logic of doing this. I think they even referenced the Mandalorian, like behind the scenes, where it's where it's like you couldn't have Master Chief just being cased in the helmet the entire time because you wouldn't be able to get anything out of him. And I'd be like, yeah, I'd be like yeah, in the games, but even the more newer ones, like Halo Four and Infinite in particular, very human versions of Master Chief, and he's always in the helmet and it works. So, I mean, this is no disrespect to Pablo Schreiber who plays. Master Chief in this. Like, my god, is he trying, but he's not particularly charismatic. The suit looks great. Don't get me wrong. Even at point, it does look very plasticky. It looks very early 2000s Doctor Who, which is mostly just down to the lighting, I think. Um, so, I'm a bit I'm a bit iffy on that. We'll get to some more okay. things that will change. Um, I watch episode two as well. Um, we get our first hint of the Halo Array. So, so this so this is still set in twenty five fifty two, much like the original trilogy, but they haven't faced the hero rear. You get your first hint of Cortana because Captain Halsey's in this, but she's British, as you do. Um, not much to say. I wasn't particularly interested. Um, and then eventually I got to episode three as well. More interested than the other two, mostly for two things. One. Um, one of the changes they make to the Covenant is that there's a human who's part of the Covenant, which I thought, yeah, that wouldn't okay, fly in the games different. at all. Yeah. So I can't, yeah. I can't remember her name, but she's referred to them as the Blessed One, who I think is supposed to be someone who's got some sort of like foresight or something. I think. Again, I'm only three episodes yeah, I mean, and there's not much there. I can see why they do that because, I mean, in, in the Halo games, they have like a prophet. Yeah. Which is like some yeah, weird like creature thing that sits in a throne so yeah i think I there kind is of, i kind of like the idea of that they do have a few of them here and one of them i know is referred to as the prophet of mercy i think um i'm, I'm yeah. pretty certain the prophet of truth will rock up at some point um but episode three is where we finally get cortana played once again by jen taylor from from the games that's that's like the one link that they've got um, it wasn't mm -hmm. actually going to be her initially but then they decided like about halfway through production well it kind of has to be her um, yeah. they only changed changes changed the design, so she's not actually as nearly as blue as she is in the game. She she just looks like a hologram human, basically. Um, the design of her costume is pretty similar, but it just looks like a it just looks like a bodysuit essentially. Um, I'm not gonna lie when when she's on screen, it's certainly, certainly more interesting. She's very charismatic and energetic as she is in the games. Um, yeah, and the relationship between her and Master Chief is very interesting. It's a lot more brash and hostile because I haven't had that relationship yet um, so I'm curious how that's going to go further along but again it's like I don't mind them changing things but what they're doing so far hasn't particularly warranted the change but at the same time I don't want them to do a straight up remake of the original game in mostly live action some of the CGI is very very ropey like it's even worse than some of the Halo games Especially more recently, like I mean, that's saying something. Maybe not like as bad as like the original trilogy, because that's just you know you can't you can't say it's worse than two thousand seven bloody cutscenes like how we. Yeah, um, yeah. But it's still it definitely bothers us. Um, I'll I'll still try and catch it when I can, because um, I think my week free trial ends on Tuesday. Um, I did also watch Obi Wan Kenobi episode six. Um, we'll say more later on. Um, it's probably the strongest one but i've still got things to say and there's a lot oh, yeah. to say 
Without a doubt. Yeah. Um, had a bit of a theatre trip on, on Thursday because um, I kept on forgetting that this was a thing. Me, me and my girlfriend had booked about two and a bit years ago to go and see the Book of Mormon. Have you ever seen, Have you ever heard of the Book of Mormon? No. So this is the bit that Not I referenced all. earlier on about us both watching things about about something to do with the church. So this yeah, is a, I can see why you've done that now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is a satirical story of a group of Mormons who go to Uganda to recruit new members for their religion. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and it's American. So I mean, like they're from New York and they and they and they're going to to Uganda. Um, absolutely hilarious. Like. I laughed Are so Are they like hard proper New Yorkers? Like, do they do they have that very prominent New York accent? Um, not nearly as much as you think. Um, I right. mean, like, Cause I was gonna say it would have it probably would have been absolutely hysterical if they had like proper New yeah. York accents and attitude towards like mm. like going to Uganda. I mean, I haven't seen it, but I, I that to me personally would have me in fits. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, like, it's a musical as well, and the music is amazing. Um, there's, I mean, there's a couple of, there's a couple of highlights I'll mention. One, um, there's a character that one of the, um, that one of the Mormons um, is talking to in Uganda, um, who is Ugandan, obviously, and cannot pronounce a name. So every single time he talks to her, it's something else beginning with an N. Not, not, not like that. I should stress. Yeah, I was going to say. Oof. So it goes from... Nicaragua to Nicki Minaj to Nigel Farage <laughs> oh, God. Nutella <laughs> <laughs> honestly you know what is the Nigel Farage bit so this, this character like, just does worse than me at trying to pronounce things oh it's on it's honestly hilarious um because they're struggling really hard to actually um get these get these villagers to join the Mormon uh religion so so the so like it's like the main character decides to lie about what's in the book because even he thinks the book is boring. Um, so he right. starts so he starts referencing the Death Star, the Starship Enterprise, Star Trek, <laughs> um, and frogs and all that sort of stuff, and it and it ends up culminating in them actually joining them, and then they put on, um, they put on a play of the version of Joseph Smith who starred the Mormon religion, um, but it's the version that they've been told. And you can just see off in the corner, just saw like one of the elders at the moment, just like, um, I don't think this is what's in the book. <laughs> um, and I don't want to like, like, sort of like dumb down like, like how, how good the comedy is. But I think the funniest, one of the funniest things that came out of it was us leaving. Um, not that. It's like, it was funny when, when, when it finally finished and we left. Um, there's, as we got outside, we started heading back to the car. Um, a friend of mine from work, he was with us um, for for the show. Uh, shout out, shout out to Nathan. Hi, Nathan. Um, he was stopped by someone who was dressed very similar to the Mormons in the show, just just with like a different tie on. And they started asking him questions about like what he thought of the show, what his favorite stuff were, and blah blah blah. And we started walking away, and then we started listening a little bit more. Um, as we came to realize. Uh, he wasn't part of the show. He was an actual Mormon that was using the popularity of the Book of Mormon to wait for people outside no the show way. to get no to get way. more people interested in becoming Mormons. And I was no just like, "You've way. got to be shitting me!" <laughs> <laughs> what What is the absolute chance of something I happening like I that? I wouldn't care. Honestly, literally, me saying this now, I'm still thinking, nah. Surely not, especially because because like the outfit, bar the tie, is identical, completely identical. I'm just like, no, nah, you talk wouldn't about do that. knowing how to market. <laughs> I mean, look, it's genius. <laughs> it's absolutely <laughs> genius. Um, yeah, I just I wasn't expecting that, but I, I had an absolute laugh with it. So I thought I thought it was great. I'd definitely watch it again. Um, now, uh, the boys season three. Now this is um, this has been marketed as the most controversial episode of the boys ever. Um, All right. Leading up to it, um, it had a lot of disclaimers about what was actually in the episode, which is based mm-hmm. on a spin-off of the boys comics. Um, the title of which is called Hero Gasm. 
Okay. It doesn't hold back. So, yeah. In the context of the show, it is the 70th um, Herogasm gathering, which is um, a lot of soups, as they're referred to in the show. They're referred to as soups if they've got like abilities and stuff like that. Um, having an absolutely massive orgy. Think of something like uh, Society that we watched. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, but, that's what I was just about to say. But with a lot of superheroes. <laughs> oh, dear. I, oh dear. I <laughs> loved it. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's got more blood, explosions, death, orgies, and sex, and all that stuff that I've ever seen on the boys, and it's brilliant. There's, I mean, it gets pretty dark, especially when there's a point when their version of the Flash, uh, Air Train, as he's referred to, is so angry with one of the other soups or characters, or whatever, that he literally grabs him by the leg. And drags him along the floor at supersonic speeds. Ow. And he's just a pile by the end. <laughs> I just, I was like, oh my god. <laughs> um, there's also a lot of similarities to, to BVS in places when their version of Superman Homelander deals with Carl Urban's character, who's now got superpowers briefly. And they're just duking it out, and it's absolutely awesome. Um, mm-hmm. Again, every single week, I'm going to recommend this show. And I know you keep on saying, I'm going to get to it. I'm going to get to it. I, You know what it is, right? Like, I've I've recently signed up to, well, resubscribed to Marvel's Unlimited. And we'll be subscribing to what is called, I'll find it. DC Universe Infinite, which has finally come to the UK so I can read a bunch of DC comics. Hurrah. <laughs> Hurrah. Because this was strictly like a US thing, so it's finally come to the UK. Mm-hmm. I was like, yes, finally. Finally. Yeah, I'm I'm going to start reading the boys' comics and probably from there just go straight to it. It's on the priority, you'll be pleased to know. Definitely. Uh, it is on priority. As it should be. Um, although I'll, I'll give a shout out to Jenny at work. She was telling me about how uh, she'd been watching it. I was like, oh, okay, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting that. And then she said that she'd, that she'd mentioned it to, I think it was either a mum or a gran. And I was like, oh, that, that, yeah, do, do, do not mention the voice of your parents. That, <laughs> that is a bad idea. <laughs> and even she was like, yeah, yeah, a little bit. Um, now, the final one. Um, I, I didn't even know this this was a thing until I randomly found it on uh, Netflix. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called Man vs. B. You know what? I was going to watch this. I was tempted to. Um, look, I like Rowan Atkinson's humour, and I grew up with Rowan Atkinson's humour. That's probably mm-hmm. why I still find him pretty funny. Uh, I was actually going to watch this, and then I realised it was like a, a series thing. Like, So it's nine episodes. The episodes seem to be under... 20 minutes? Yes, yes. From what I've seen. So the first episode's 20 minutes. Like, I set everything up, and then every other one is about 10 minutes. Um, mm-hmm. So you can either watch this in one go, as like a 90-minute film, if you wanted, or you're going to watch it in yeah. segments, either or. Um, so for those who don't know, it's a sketch comedy, you know, starring Ron Ro- 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 Atkinson as a man who's house-sitting for someone. He's never house-sitted in his life. Um, or needs to be forced to deal with, um, like, because this house is, like, very modern. You've got, like, Rather than opening a drawer, you have to use gestures. Um, instead of keys yeah. for locks, you have to speak and stuff like that. There's alarms and everything you can't use because he's in like his 50s or 60s. He's also got like a 17 year old daughter. And I'm like, I don't like this trend of like 60 year olds with like teenage kids. I'm like, that doesn't that doesn't fly, I don't think. But anyway, mm-hmm. um, so he's doing all this. He's trying to deal with his house and um, looking after it. While also dealing with a bee. It seems to have a very personal beef with them. Um, <laughs> leading to hilarity and damage and chaos and all the sort of stuff you'd expect from this sort of thing. Um, I'm not going to lie, I laughed way too hard in places at this. I wasn't expecting to, because I, I don't like Mr. Bean, if I'm honest. I don't like that kind of Blast thing. Blasphemy! I know, I know. Especially because um, because I live in Consus. Uh, Ron Atkinson was born in Consus. So that's like our claim to fame. Um, you wouldn't be able to tell with his accent. It's just not Northern at all. The bastard. Um, oh, sorry, the bastard. Uh, the bastard. The bastard. Um, the bastard B. Yeah, you know what it is? I really like how they're like, 
they'll have like really dramatic music at times for the B. Yeah. As if it's like as if it's like the primary antagonist of like a big blockbuster. It's great. Um, it over dramatizes it, but oh, it's yeah. so funny. Yeah, like I'm not gonna say too much because I mean I, I definitely recommend it, and, and you know this, it definitely does things I wasn't expecting, namely with the dog that lives in the house. Um, yeah. there's a point where I think it wants me to laugh at what Rowan Atkinson's character Trevor does to the dog accidentally. Um, I didn't laugh; I was just horrified. <laughs> I was like, Jesus Christ, man! <laughs> um, but no, I I was thoroughly entertained um i can sort of see i can definitely see why people might be put off with this um it is like a really like old school kind of sketch comedy um but honestly i can't help but laugh at it quite frankly yeah i i um, definitely from from what i saw in the trailer it was sort of mr bean combined with a bit of johnny english in it i mean i like the johnny english films for the majority yeah this one's actually the, directed the second by... the second one i found a little bit funnier because of the the whole cat sketch where you know like he he goes to the cat and he's like here's a good puss mm-hmm. there's a good puss puts it out the window and it falls into the freaking chipper <laughs> i yeah. just laughed so badly at that i thought oh my god yeah i think i've only seen the last half an hour of the first one and then i watched the second one um but man vs b is directed by the guy who did the third one which i actually forgot was a thing i think it's johnny english strikes yeah. again or something I'm like, yeah, wow, Johnny English Strikes Again. Because awesome the second one is Johnny English Reborn. <laughs> yeah, only reason I remember that one is, is when Ron Atkinson was talking about it on an episode of Top Gear. And you realise he's like an absolute like, car fanatic and you're like, oh my god. Like, where the hell has this come from? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, that is my watches. Um, we're now going to uh, kick back to one of the other ones that, that I did say I watched, but I kept it very vague, as did you. Um, we're now doing spoilers for Obi-Wan Kenobi. Um now, we've kept it quite vague with our thoughts on each episode previously because, you know, as I say, I knew we were going to be delving into this properly. And I think after watching yeah. the final episode, I, you know, I do actually have a review on Letterboxd if people want to read it. Um, it's, I don't think I, I delved into too many spoilers, but definitely going to go into it a little bit more here. Um, I've not been... So if you haven't watched the entirety and don't want to hear spoilers, now would be a good time to stop listening to us rant and rave. Yeah, you know, like the 14 or 15 people that are subscribed to this. Thanks, by the way, for the 13, 14, 15 subscribers that we've got. That's that's really yes, nice. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think even you know, so I haven't been overwhelmingly positive on the series thus far. And by the end, I am still mm. not entirely positive, if I'm honest. I don't know how you think in terms of like your general thoughts. My general thoughts on it, I mean, as I said the last time we spoke about it, you know, this is something we Star Wars fans have wanted for a long time. Does it satisfy me? Yeah. Is it 5 out of 5? No. No. Is it enjoyable? Yeah. Mm-hmm. As its problems, which I which we're going to talk about, because I, I feel okay. like we're both on the same sort of planet for this, more or less. <laughs> yeah, but, um, yeah, I'm... I think it's okay. Overall, I mm-hmm. think it's okay. I I give it a solid three out of five. I do like it. I just don't think it's good. And while there are certainly bits that I like, some moments that I think are genuinely amazing, um, and there's a lot of things I like in concept. The execution on for the most part isn't good, to be honest. Um, there's some really weird choices they made behind the scenes. Um, I mean, I'm curious as to what the scripts were that they got rid of at the last minute. Um, as far as I know, I think the show was initially going to be Obi Wan protecting Luke from Tusken Raiders for like a few episodes. I'm like, that's not very interesting, especially because the more yeah. recent Star Wars shows have done a very good job of painting the Tusken Raiders as not being mindless savages. Which I like. Well, particularly one series would just focus, like, what, like, two or three episodes just solely on the Tusken Raiders? Uh-huh. That was supposed Something to be like Boba that. Fett, yeah. and it was just Tusken Fett? Yeah. <laughs> Tusken um, Fett. But, yeah, general-wise, I think it's okay. Um, we'll delve yeah. into some specifics. So we'll start, obviously, with, you know, the man himself, Ewan McGregor as Obi-Wan Kenobi. First time playing the character since 2003, 
last time we saw him was in 2005. Um, he's still great. You know, he's you know he was oh, yeah. always Without the gold standard with the prequels. Like he was probably the best cast. Well, some of the best casting, I think, full stop. And I think if they were going to do an Obi Wan series without you and McGregor, it would be terrible. I think it's his delivery, oh, yes. his gravitas. <laughs> it, it would be utterly pointless. Oh yeah, definitely. You, you can't get you and McGregor, and, like you, you can't get somebody to replace you and McGregor as Obi Wan Kenobi. It's just not possible. No. That being said, he is Obi Wan Kenobi. Yeah. That being said, they do a really good job with with Kenobi in the Clone Wars, from from what I've seen. But obviously, yeah, you couldn't do that here; it just wouldn't work. Um, I quite like the arc that Obi Wan goes on, where he's like completely consumed with guilt and remorse, and is just completely defeated. Um, I don't really like the fact that he's kind of forced to go off on this adventure. He doesn't actively choose it. Like, there's like two or three instances he's like, no, no. I don't want to. Why? Um, yeah. And then, then when you've got Jimmy Smith's back as Bail Organa, basically on his hands and knees, just going, please go and rescue my daughter before before she gets kidnapped again in the future. Like, it's it's an interesting choice. Now, I will say this, I am glad that they released the first two episodes together because if it was just the first episode, I would have turned off pretty quickly. Because there's nothing that goes on in that first episode. In hindsight, I can barely remember anything beyond. Yeah, I, I can definitely agree with you on that. I think if it wasn't for that second episode, I just would not have paid attention to the future episodes of it. Like, because yeah, let's face it, it's... nothing definitive happens in that first episode. Look, it's interesting, but it's nothing to cement it. Yeah, it's it's just as a sort of filler. It's just mm-hmm. an introductory episode, I'd say. And there's definitely a lot of filler in this show, especially with episode four. Oh, without a doubt. I want to say without it. a doubt. In the Fortress Inquisitorius or whatever it's called. Um, I still cringe at that point when he's like trying to get Leia out with uh, Tala and he's got Leia under his court. I'm just like, I do not believe that for a second, even though Stormtroopers have really bad eyes you know what? This is with gonna, their helmets. Do you know what? I'm going to say it here. I'm going to say it here. You remember in those Lego Star Wars games when you had to get like a Stormtrooper helmet and put it on on mm-hmm. the character you were playing as and it's like Chewbacca or something and the helmet would be slightly hanging off. Yeah. It reminded me of that. Yeah. <laughs> it reminded no, me so much of that, like trying to escort this little girl and other character under a cloak and there's mm. all these Stormtroopers and Imperial officers around and no one bats an eye. It's like, What? No, it's... Are you blind? Yeah. Um, speaking of those um, Stormtroopers and, in, and Inquisitors, uh, we, of course, get the the live-action introduction of the Inquisitors. Uh, first thing, I believe in Star Wars Rebels, I want to say. Actually, yes, I, I, I would be. Um, I think Rupert Friend is the Grand Inquisitor. I think gives one of the best over-the-top hammy performances in Star Wars for a long time. Um, I really like him a lot. Especially the meme-worthy moments of him standing over Reva in episode 5 and he's just like, Hello! <laughs> you know, as soon as that episode was done, it just became a bloody meme within oh, a was... matter of minutes. You know what I mean? It was, it, it, it was beautiful. I actually really like him. Hello! I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah, he doesn't look like the version in the show, but neither does Obi-Wan or Darth Maul or anyone, really. Like, it is an art style. It doesn't matter. Though, apparently, I think his species is the same one that Obi-Wan comes across in Episode 3 on Utapau. I think, you know, like the weird, like, like really tall-headed, grey-skinned ones. Ah, uh, yes, when um, Kenobi With... goes to find Grievous, Grievous yeah. on that weird place. Yeah, I think it, yeah. it, it does look apparently like the same species. It's the same species. It does. Yeah. Um, but look, I don't mind. I think, I think it's really fun. And it's just nice seeing like the weird like double bladed uh, spinny lightsaber thing. Um, I still maintain that at one point, I, I think it's like when you're saying where is he in episode two, and you can see him like Conti Spinner. I can guarantee he chopped off a limb of that guy, and I think we all know which limb it was. <laughs> 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 oh, it got dark. Um, Sung Kang is the I, I think it's the fifth brother he plays. Um, pointless. I think he actually vanishes after episode four. <laughs> You, you, you just mm. don't see him again. Um, yeah. Um, 
obviously we'll talk about Reaver. Um, mixed feelings on it. Put it that way. I despise the fact that she doesn't get any character until episode five, and then we're supposed to care for the yeah. rest of the show. And I'm like, no, no. Like it does kind of change the opening of the series when it does open with Order sixty six, and I'm sure that w- I'm sure like the young one that that like it does focus on briefly is her. But no offense, we all knew that. Like. Especially, I mean, look, I've got limited knowledge of the Inquisitors in Star Wars, but I'm aware that they are meant to be fallen Jedi. So that fits in pretty well. Um, I'm also yeah. trying to figure out how um, how she could possibly know that Darth Vader is Anakin Skywalker. Especially because it constantly refers to him as Lord Vader in the Order 66 stuff, and given she's like 9 or 10. Yeah, I was... I was picking my brain about this because I was like, well, she was a youngling and, you know, Anakin wasn't Darth Vader then. He was just Anakin, a deranged sociopath. Mm -hmm. How could she possibly know that he transformed into Lord Vader? That just, it doesn't make any sense. Like, did, did Lord, did Lord Sidious just like ring her up and it's like, oh yes, Anakin Skywalker is Vader. Yeah, it's just... (sighs) I didn't get it, and um, the thing is, though, is that the idea of a story of a fallen Jedi who becomes an Inquisitor and gets close enough to Darth Vader to hopefully exact her revenge on him and kill him, that's a fantastic idea. Like, I actually really like yeah. that idea. It just doesn't... I just don't think it's a good idea to have that as the side plot in a story about Obi-Wan getting over his grief. I think it should have been its own thing. Yeah. Which I think a lot of other people have been saying... Um, I know it's quite a few people. I, I like, felt in the same way. Like I, I, as as I said, I like the show, but it should have just been Obi Wan. It should not have had these subplots, because it's like, well, there's enough there to have it as its own thing, without mm-hmm. a doubt. I mean, don't get me wrong. I I enjoyed the subplot. It it grabbed my attention. You know, it was pretty, pretty interesting to say the least. You know, finding out that this, this absolute psychopath of a of an inquisitor was once a innocent youngling and she's the way she is because a deranged padawan decides to go kill a bunch of people well, exactly. younglings it's just but yeah i it's like episode five where like you truly get some character out of her and it's just like well that was a bit pointless <laughs> yeah it's like, like too... why should i give a damn now yeah it's like too little too late you've left it way too long um, yeah, because you, you've just made her this antagonist for three solid episodes, and then you get to this, well, four episodes, I should say, then you get to this fifth episode, and the tables turn slightly, mm. and in the sixth episode, it's just a total, like, flip of the table. I think as well, it's like, her redemption is completely unearned, it's basically the same as Ben Solo. I actually still maintain that, like, uh, in the original version of episode nine that Colin Trevorrow was going to do, he was going to kill Kylo Ren at the end because he can't be redeemed at all. Yeah, and I can get, I can see why some people even thought that Darth Vader shouldn't be redeemed by like by like a single act of goodwill. Um, but Reva absolutely doesn't deserve that at all. I mean, yeah, she has, you know, she even says like she's become exactly what she was trying to kill. Like, yeah, you did. Yeah. What do you want to do? Like, do you want to feel sorry for you? No, you're you're an absolute murderer, crazy person. Um. <laughs> And it's again. I mean, this is no, this is no discredit to the actors. Like they're all doing really spot on stuff. Even Moses Ingram did really well with the portrayal. Even if I think she should have been dialed back a bit, I actually think the way she is in Episode Four when she's interrogating Leia, I think that should have been sort of like the base level. It shouldn't have been as like loud and oh, yes. angry as it is in the early ones where she's just shouting all the time. And so like that's where not... she she becomes Christian Bale's Batman. <laughs> yeah. Where's Obi Wan? <laughs> um, <laughs> so it, it it could literally just be that though. Like you you just needed to give her the little like bat cowl thing, and and there you go. Could could have literally been an intergalactic version of Batman. It could have been better. Who knows? Um, Where is he? <laughs> Where's Obi Wan? Um, now, obviously, one of the biggest talking points before this show dropped was the announcement that. Hayden Christensen was going to be back as Anakin, but mostly Darth Vader. 
Um, so I'm not going to get to the point where some people are where they're saying that it's an absolute waste of Hayden Christensen. I can see why. Mm because I'm sure people would have liked to have seen a little bit more flashbacks than the one that we got, which, granted, I wasn't expecting to see, and when I did, I could have cried, which I think I mentioned last week without spoiling it. Um, I thought that was really, really sweet. I really liked that. But also just seeing, like, like a good, brotherly relationship between Anakin and Obi-Wan for just a brief moment. Um, yeah. I do like the contrast and comparison between the flashbacks and the present day to show that that Anakin hasn't learned a thing when it yeah. comes to like definitely. I mean, even I mean that that was in the the duel between them, and you know, Obi Wan points out that his his quest to be the victor is what is his downfall, and ultimately he is. Yeah, you know, it it's is. Like, say say you are defeated, mm-hmm. and Obi Wan's like, well, no, no, not really. Sorry, mate. No. <laughs> No, um, as we saw in episode three, yeah, the high ground. <sighs> that duel in episode three isn't very good, which I suppose is delib- it's, it's not supposed to be very good, because no one is really rusty, one is just angry. <laughs> um, that being said, I did love the idea of him um, using the lightsaber to burn a lot of fuel to try and torch Obi Wan in the same way that he was. I thought that is pretty great. So I really like. I that. I really like that. Everything about that scene, I liked the lighting, the whole... It was so evil. Like, he just... Mm-hmm. He literally just did it without even thinking. It was just, like, zap. The thing I find fascinating, though, and I, think, I thought this was something that this show would actually talk about. Now, I've got, like, a major nitpick to deal with when it comes to episode three. Um, yeah. With Darth Vader's suit and how it is literally just the one from Empire and Return of the Jedi. It's not the mm-hmm. one from A New Hope. So credit of rule one, the suit that's in there looks very similar to that. The Darth Vader suit that's in this show just looks like the Empire one again. So I thought there was actually going to be an in-universe reason why the suit would change. And I I think they tried to do it where, you know, by episode six and the suit is completely botched. But then you see him at the very end and it looks like it's just the exact same armor again. Minus like... The red eyes, kind of thing. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, I don't know if I'm, I'm like a nitty gritty nerd who just notices these things, but I really I mean, didn't like that. It, it didn't really bother me, but I, I went back and looked on the on the changes of it, and I think to somebody like yourself, when you you're very nitpicky with it, not necessarily a bad thing. It just means you pay more attention to things like that. Yeah. But, um. Yeah, I I picked up on it. It didn't really bother me. Nah didn't bother me i was i was too invested in the duels we'll say yeah uh though that being said this show does prove that hayden christensen wasn't the problem with the prequels as people kept on trying to do it like even at the time i thought no he's not it's just the direction because even the good actors are doing terrible um this series does prove that hayden christensen is a very talented actor and i think he did really really good with what we got from him um oh yeah would i like to have seen more yes of course hell Definitely. i think the one the one thing that I really wanted to see was a flashback to them during the Clone Wars show where they'd have live action versions of the suits that they wore. Like I thought that would have been amazing. Like I would have loved that. Um, but again, yeah. it's not entirely needed. What we guess I think works. Um, that Well, actually before we get to the final gym, we'll do, we'll, we'll briefly mention Princess Leia who I didn't realise was going to be in this show, and I suppose it makes perfect sense that she would be, because she clearly has knowledge of all, of all we want in A New Hope. We get to see why. Um, she's adorable. Like, absolutely yeah. adorable. Um, like, I, I mean, I loved a lot of what, of what they did with Leia, despite the fact that she is just... Mostly just kidnapped a lot. Um... I mean, remember really the last time when we spoke about Obi Wan, and I certainly mentioned that it was getting a bit rinse and repeat, especially with like Leia gets kidnapped again. again. Oh no! Um, that being said, Vivian Lyra Blair, who plays her, absolutely terrific. I think she's absolutely. I mean, she's such a foil for Obi Wan. Like, like she really can just stand up to him in like every single instance, which is perfect for Leia because that's the kind of character that she is. 
Um, I don't know like, what episode it is. Like even, it might be one even of the, the original film. One of the early episodes where she she says something cheeky and Obi Wan is just like, "Excuse me," <laughs> like I just chuckled <laughs> at that somewhere. I think it's it's something to do with like they they tried to be incognito by saying that Obi Wan is her father and she's like, "Yeah, grandfather" or something like that. Yeah. And he's like, excuse me? <laughs> I was like, ah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I agree. She is Her acting is so good. And coming from a child actor as well, like a lot of people see child actors as, as somebody who isn't like the highlight of it. To me, she is a highlight of Obi-Wan as a series. I mean, she has so much character to it. She brings a lot to the character. You feel for her. That's what's important. But now let's get to the final duel. Um, I've rewatched this a lot, if I'm honest. Mm-hmm. Like, too much. <laughs> um, I actually think I this is... I won't lie. So did I. Well, is it? I think this is one of my favourite lightsaber like, duels in all of Star Wars, if I'm completely honest. Mm-hmm. I love how haphazard it is. I love how Vader stumbles constantly because he's just consumed with rage and, again, hasn't learned a thing. Um, I love that Obi-Wan's on the offensive for the entire time. And of course, I love how it ends. But I'm curious what you think. I tell you what, I wasn't expecting it. And I'm definitely in the agreement that it is one of the best duels in the Star Wars series. Mm-hmm. I I really, really liked how Obi-Wan uses Vader's rage against him. Yeah. I thought that was brill. Mm-hmm. You know, because Anakin or Vader is so consumed by this rage that Obi Wan uses it to his advantage, and just when we think that Obi Wan is defeated, he rises up and just hurls a load of rocks at him. For it. <laughs> absolutely goes for it and rips a part of his helmet off. And I thought that was absolutely rad. I was like to see how disfigured this mm-hmm. rage-filled Padawan is. Yeah, by like the second half of the fight, I was I was even saying to my girlfriend because we're both watching it. I was like, I'm I'm hoping to God that they tear off his helmet. I really want that, not just because I've seen oh, yeah. a little bit of it in Rebels with like a Sorka. It's a very similar scene, um, but just knowing that it's Hayden Christensen this time, just change up entirely. And honestly, just that entire that entire sequence with mm-hmm. them just talking, and and you know, you and mm-hmm. McGregor is basically pulled to tears. Um, but you know what it is? It's just the lines from Vader that really got me. Like, especially when it's like, I'm not your failure. You didn't kill Anakin Skywalker. I did. And you just see a slight smile off him. And that's just terrifying because it's just like, suddenly I'm getting images of Vader smiling underneath the helmets, which is not something I usually think of with him. Um, but it's just. <sighs> I absolutely adore it. Oh, I love that. I love that scene. Just the idea of him smiling under the helmet is just even more terrifying. Um, but you know what it is? I think the bit that I didn't... I didn't realise to do, because I hadn't picked up on it when I first seen... Or even, like, in retrospect, when I've seen the original film. Mm-hmm. Obi-Wan just calls him Darth. Doesn't call him Anakin. Which suppose makes sense, <laughs> because at the time, George Lucas had no idea what, what was going to happen. So this actually has him calling him Darth at the end because he realizes that Anakin is just dead. He's not Anakin anymore. Yeah. I can't refer to him as that. And he just says, goodbye, Darth. And I was like, that's such an amazing retroactive reason. Um, Similar to Rogue One with the Death Star plans and how the reason for that was of um, Mads Mikkelsen, uh, the actor, not the character that he plays. It's yep. just the actor who came on set and thought, I'm going to build, I, I, I'm going to build a floor. Um, but I just I, I really loved that just like that entire little bit was some of the finest Star Wars I've seen in a long time it, it really made up for a lot of the other issues I had with the show that being said it doesn't fix it entirely but yeah. as I say it's easily the strongest episode because of it um, that being said I don't like the fact that it keeps on cutting back to Reva hunting Luke because there's no tension there because we know Luke's going to freaking survive um what do you think? Yeah, I mean 
the, especially the bit with Reva, I mean, as I say, it was mixed feelings towards it. I mean, it was stupid, that, that thing, because we know that Luke's going to survive. There was no horror tension to it because it was like, well, we know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, k- killing him off would just be the end of everything. It would be an absolute apocalypse. Yeah. Of everything. But sort of to do with that scene, and I I waited so long for this, and I was just praying, praying for the hello there. Yeah. Look, okay, look. <laughs> at the time... Would you like to meet him? <laughs> look, at the hello time, there. I really liked this. I thought it was funny. In retrospect... It's like he's got a catchphrase, and Obi Wan doesn't have a catchphrase. These characters yeah. wouldn't have catchphrases. It's just so fangasmy for me. <laughs> it is. I think it is just a, a. It is a thing just dedicated to fans up until that point, as I think was the rather interesting cameo Aww. of Master Qui Gon Jin. Fucking Liam Neeson getting his paycheck for thirty minutes. <laughs> I mean, come on. Um, Look, I I didn't think it was special. It was it was cool to see. Don't get me wrong, but it was nothing remotely like interesting. It was like, ah, oh, Liam Neeson. Hi, Qui Gon. Gone. I... Been a while. Yeah. Well, I mean, here's the thing. I did I did like really like that bit at, at the time. But when you think about it, it's like, in retrospect, once you watch the entire series, you have a look at episode three and look where that ends up with. Obi Wan living as a hermit, calling himself Ben Kenobi, protecting a young Luke Skywalker, and learning new force abilities from Qui Gon Jinn. The start yep. of the series doesn't have that; doesn't have any of that, minus him living on Tatooine, looking after Luke, or like watching Luke from afar. But now the end of the series has him at the exact same point he was in Episode Three, now with Qui Gon Jinn. So all yeah. of a sudden, bar the duel with Vader, this entire show hasn't really justified its own existence beyond just being well we'd like to see obi-wan and vader again because it might tie up a few little plot holes that aren't actually plot holes because no one really cares that much and if they do um they need the life and they should stop buying 14 games from steam <clears throat> i didn't say that <laughs> damn. i didn't say that damn damn, damn i think in, damn. in honest retrospect in some ways it is just like the ultimate star wars fan fan yeah. series we'll say it, it, it's just simply that mm-hmm. you know in, in some ways there's no substance to it it's just sort of like what spider-man no way home was it was just a fan film you know i mean mm-hmm. i love spider-man no way home oh, I, I didn't see it as that personally but i think in in some ways it's just you know something that was made for star wars fans like there, there was there was really no reason to make it aside from just filling in the plot holes which it does excellently yeah is it the perfect series? Absolutely not. Is it no. enjoyable? Yeah. Could it have done a little bit better in places? Definitely. Hundred yeah. percent. Definitely. See, uh, especially involving the Inquisitors. Yeah. But again, you know, I uh, think as well. Hit and miss. I think as well as the fact that there's four Inquisitors, like three or four Inquisitors, not a single one actually fights Obi Wan. Once. Yeah. That's. <laughs> and considering how much Reva just wants Obi Wan, you'd think they would have like some duel or something. Never happens. I think as well Never, as the fact happens. that I don't, like like it sets up this this like interesting thing where like she is like desperate to find Obi Wan and kill him, but the series never actually explains why him specifically. Like even with the whole reveal of her hunting yeah. Vader, that doesn't beyond him being trained by Obi Wan. There's no reason for him. Well, there's no reason for her to go or to go after Obi Wan. So it doesn't make any sense. I actually argued initially before the trip, before the series dropped, that them finding Kenobi was actually an accident. Because I don't believe yeah. that they knew that much. I I don't know. There's just so many weird. And you know what? You make an extremely valid point because it's like, well, why is she going after Obi Wan when Anakin Skywalker slash Lord Vader did this to her, not Obi Wan? Obi Wan isn't the bad guy in this. You've just mm-hmm. coincidentally stumbled upon him and blame him yeah, exactly. because he, you were his, his mentor, you know. But in some ways, it's not exactly Obi Wan's fault. Obi Wan blames himself, but it's not really his fault, mm-hmm. so to speak. Yeah. 
So it's like, well, why are you going after Obi-Wan when you should just be going after Vader? But then it's revealed that she eventually goes after Vader. But it's, as you said, it's too little too late mm -hmm. to actually give a shit. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, one final bit on Vader. Um, this is something I just noticed. Um, I noticed after episode... I mean, I can't remember if I mentioned about it um, when we talked briefly about episode three. Um, when you finally hear Vader talking about how they're using the same AI technology they use on Luke in the Book of Boba Fett to sort of um, make his voice younger. Um, yeah. They, they did the same thing with Vader because he doesn't sound like he's in his 90s like he did in Rogue One because he would because it's James, it's James L. Jones. Um, so, I mean, it's decidedly more subtle here. Um, so I hated it with Luke because it, because then it's not really a performance. It's just instruments it's just yeah it's, it's just, just a like tool an yeah yeah it's literally a tool and i think i even i think i even referenced in my review for all one could always that i don't like where that's heading using that sort of technology to create performances because then it's not genuine at all um and then where the hell does it end but yeah similar to you this could have been a much stronger series i think in a way, it's disappointing. I still like it. Um, I think I probably still enjoy it more than Book of Boba Fett, which at this rate has one really good episode and the ending of the next one. <laughs> um, yeah. Whereas the rest of it is pretty bland and forgettable. Um, I'll definitely rewatch bits of this, but I think it is mostly just going to be the duel lot, if I'm honest. And oh, yeah, actually... yeah, I think it's it. If I was going to rewatch it, I'd probably just possibly start with episode three mm -hmm. maybe episode four hell even episode five it, yeah. it could literally just be those two episodes and I'd, I'd be fine with that yeah but as you say like i i think boba fett is definitely the weakest one i think this was pretty close to being it but it redeemed itself in some qualities to me mm -hmm. obviously that's just personal retrospective of it but in some ways i found it a little disappointing in parts because i you know, as as Star Wars fans, we've wanted this for years, as we've mentioned before and now. Yeah. So it was a little disappointing that, you know, things weren't perfect. But it's not bad. No. It's just not brilliant. Yeah, it's just kind of the worry now that Star Wars is now becoming more content, which I even said before, where, where it's like uh, the latest bit of Star Wars content uh, that we've got... Um, it's and I don't want it to be that. I still want Star Wars to feel quite special, and I think under Disney, it's not yeah. really doing that. Um, but yeah, that's our thoughts on spoilery thoughts on Obi Wan Kenobi. If you didn't realize there were spoilers, morons, honestly. Um, so thank you very much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed it. Um, like, share, subscribe, tweets, things, things that people do to get this thing into more people's ears. Um, next week we are going to be returning to the Hooniverse with the David Tennant specials of Doctor Who. That should be quite fun, especially considering it's only like four or five episodes. So we've got a little bit more to talk about. Um, that should be quite fun. Definitely some hot takes, I think. Definitely some oh, hot takes. Oh yeah, I'm gonna have to rewatch some of them. I mean, I I, I already rewatched the Next Doctor last week. I think it was last week. I can't even remember if it was last week. Um, pretty sure it was last week. Pretty sure. Thanks, Dan. You you can actually remember the crap that I've been watching, which is just <laughs> that is really embarrassing the crap for me. That Reagan's been watching. <laughs> There's so much crap or so little crap, depending on the week. <laughs> Sudden, suddenly, I should just be singing the jingles, even though I don't sing. Anyway, yes. So look forward to that next week, and uh, well, we'll catch you next week. Thanks, everyone, and take care. Take care. Goodbye. <laughs>